my name is Anita Eckstein and I was born in Lwów, Poland. I'm a Holocaust survivor. I was a child. I'm here because some people risk their lives to save mine, a Polish family, otherwise I wouldn't be here. I've lost both my parents and many other members of my family, but I'm here. And thank God, I've got three children, eight grandchildren, two great-granddaughters, and we're four generations. And I wasn't supposed to be here, so how is that? I was an only child. My father was an accountant for a chain of lumber mills. The funny thing is, so was my husband and my sons in Canada. One can't get away from the lumber. <laughs> As I said, I was an only child. I was a little spoiled. My mother couldn't have any more children, so you can imagine you know, an only child it was a big deal. I had a wonderful childhood. You know, we used to go and visit my grandparents for holidays in another town. And uh, I had aunts, uncles, cousins. It was nice. It was very nice. My father was very tall. And we lived in a small town because there was um, a lumber mill that, where he worked. He used to carry me on the... Sh on, I was sat on his shoulders and he carried me through town. That all ended when the war broke out. Well, for the first two years we were under the Russians. You know, the Russians came, then the Russians retreated, and the Nazis came in 1941. For the two years under the Russians, my life didn't change. They made this deal, which, of course, Hitler broke. And so in 1941, the Russians retreated. The Nazis came and we were sitting ducks. I certainly understood because my parents told me, you know, this is, you know, when the, when the Nazis came in, laws changed right away. Um, my parents had to, we had to go and everybody had to turn in their valuables. I remember distinctly my mother taking her wedding ring off and put it in on the basket. I didn't have anything, I'm telling you. My father had a, uh, um, it was, fall, it wasn't, I can't remember why he, they took his coat away, which was, um, had a fur collar and a fur lining. Must have been maybe early fall because he wouldn't be wearing the coat, but maybe he had to bring it. I don't know. So they tore off the fur and they threw the coat back at him. I mean, those are memories that you know I have at that early age. So of course I, I was told not really scary stuff, but it would be dangerous for Jewish people. So I knew that much. You know, things kept getting worse and worse. I had gone, I was going to a nursery school, a kindergarten, not nursery school, because I was only seven when, when the six and a half or something, when the war broke out. My father lost his job. I couldn't go to school anymore. Um, all kinds of things, scary things were happening. And one night we had a knock on the door, always at night, and they told us they're taking us to be resettled. No idea where or what. Then they asked my father his name, and when he told them his name, the three guys, the three Nazis that were there said, oh, no, you. So they went next door and took the other family, and we had a reprieve for several weeks because they knew my father was working in that company. I guess they needed them. But several weeks later, same thing happened, and this time they put us on a truck and took us about 10 kilometers, not that far, to a larger city where they had established a ghetto. Warsaw ghetto was surrounded by a wall. We were in a smaller town. We didn't have a wall, but they were watching. You couldn't go anywhere. For some reason, my parents must have known 
Well, because after the first time, so they had a couple of bags packed. So we didn't, but I still remember my mother running around, what else she should take, you know, something for me, some food, whatever. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're going to need. So we were taken to a ghetto, well, to like about 10, 15 kilometers away. We were put into an apartment with two other families. I had had my own room. All of a sudden, all these people, you know, they, so my, my mother and father were in one room and there was another family in another room and another family in another room and they shared the kitchen. And my parents were taken daily to different job sites because when the Russians retreated, they blew up railway lines, they blew up bridges, anything to stop the Nazi advance. Didn't stop them, but, but then they took the Jewish people like my parents slave labor to fix this. So, you know, they moved the rocks and God knows what they did. I'm not sure because they never told me. And I stayed with neighbors and I waited for them to come home, never knowing if they will or not. You know, it was such a scary time that I never knew, are they going to come back? Or are they not going to come back? You know, at that, that, uh, that young age, it's, it's scary. Well, I just stayed with this, with, the, with this neighbor, and I guess there were other children there, maybe other people left children. They tried to amuse us, they read stories to us. I can't even remember what they did with us. All I know, I was scared, waiting for my parents to come home. You know, they had to, my parents had to line up to get some food, but at the beginning there was some food in the ghetto, there was a store, so they could, you know, get something. But after a few months there was no store, there was nowhere to buy anything, we could not leave that area to go shopping. So they started giving us some food, I can't remember, I don't remember. I always had something, probably my parents didn't eat, but they made sure that I had something to eat. And this went on for nearly a year. Oh, we didn't wear a yellow star, that's the thing, forgot. We wore an armband, forgot. We wore an armband, a white armband with a, a blue, you know, blue um, Jewish star. So that's, in that ghetto, that's what we were. So I had, a, my mother made me a little one. So that's what we were, I forgot about that. You know what, everybody was wearing it. So I didn't, I didn't question it. My parents had it, I had it. I mean, I knew, I knew that it was dangerous for us. But I don't know if I exactly knew what it meant to die. No idea. You know, at that age, who thinks about things like that? Although, you know, in the ghetto, eventually I saw some dead people. Something you shouldn't see at that age, but anyway. And then one day, October 18, 1941, 42, sorry. For some reason, my mother didn't go to work. She took me with her. She, she said, well, we're going to go look for food. I mean, it didn't make sense because we didn't know. What, I don't know where, what she was saying. I guess she was, knew something and she wanted to get me out of the apartment. So she took me to another friend in another building. And when she stepped out of that apartment, she got picked up by a truck. I never saw her again. So I think they must have known something. They must have expected some action or something. I don't know why she left me with that all these years. Can you imagine? I'm still wondering why did she leave me at that particular time? If I had been with her, they would have taken me too. So by minutes, 
You know, it's something that I can't get through my head. Why? Anyway, she must have heard something. She must have known something. I, I don't know. I, I will never know. My father was absolutely desperate. Can you imagine his wife was, you know, they, I didn't see her being taken, but other people did. So they told him, so he knew. You know, people had been disappearing from the ghetto for a while, but nobody knew where, what, where were they going, what were they doing with them. Now we know that they were taken to a death camp called Belgians, strictly a death camp. And nobody lived there more than a few hours. We didn't know that then, but we know that from that area of Poland, this is there where they went. You know, they had it so figured out that from different areas, they went to different places. My mother went to Belgium. And suddenly, I, you know, I know my grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins, they all ended up, all ended up there because from that area. And my father was desperate. He figured if I stay in the ghetto, I'll be next. He met a Polish man who worked also in that, uh, in that, lumber, uh, in that lumber yard. Well, actually, by then, my father was not in the lumber yard. They had him working on the bridge. Anyway, he met a Polish man there who had been brought to work also. And they became friends, and they talked a lot. And I guess eventually my father asked him if he would help save me. Now, you have to know, guys, this was against the law. If they got you, if they got you that you were helping a Jewish person, you and your whole family could be, would be killed. So this was amazing. Many, many people took that. I know other, I, so I'm, I'm, a head, I'm a hidden child. So there's many others that I've met, same thing. He took me again during the night because hopefully nobody would see me. It wasn't that far. I don't know how many kilometers, but it was in a, another town. It took maybe a couple of hours. He took me in a horse-drawn wagon, put me on the bottom. He covered me with straw, and that's how he took me to his family. He had a wife and a daughter who was learning to be a teacher, and I became her guinea pig. <laughs> She taught me how to read, you know, that was with them for several months. Um, I still knew my father was okay because the men came home every couple of weeks or so and told me about my father. And then, of course, he could tell my father that I was okay. Well, eventually, somebody, we don't know who, we, to this day, we don't know who, some neighbor went to the police and said uh, something like, go check that house, there's a new kid over there. So two policemen with, uh, not, not Nazis, two, I think they were Ukrainian, I'm not sure, anyway, two, two policemen came to get me. But we were sitting sort of in the, li in the living, dining or whatever, and she was teaching me and she saw through the window two policemen walking by, not going to the door. You know how you do things without thinking? She picked me up, she ran with me to the back of the house, it was a one-story house, and she literally threw me out of the window. It was February 1943. You know, the weather in Poland is like here. You know what February is like? I wasn't dressed. I was wearing slippers. Where am I going to go? So there was an outhouse out there. So I went there, and I closed the door, and I sat there for five hours, freezing. But I was afraid to come out because I didn't know what was happening. 
that day, when I was sitting there, I heard these repeated noises, but I had no idea what it was. They took whoever they found that day to the cemetery, and they were shot. What I was hearing was the shots. So again, I escaped. I don't know. I don't know why, but that's the second time that I escaped. Of course, they couldn't keep me anymore. They were scared they would come back, which apparently they did. No, at that time, you know, they just didn't let me out of the house. They didn't want me to go any, you know, nobody should see me, but well, obviously somebody did, right? Although they took me Christmas uh, Eve, they took me to church, and I guess somebody saw me, and they weren't sure who's this, who's this kid all of a sudden? Um, their children were not married, so the it couldn't have been, you know, one, one of the kids. Anyway, so they couldn't keep me. They took me back to my father. He took me, Joseph, his name was Joseph, took me back to my father. There were no more, ghetto was no more. Three months later, there was no more ghetto. They had a few of these men working in our original town. My father, one of them and they kept them in the house. When I was brought back in there, I had no idea where I was because again, it was in the middle of the night. Many years later, I went back there with my husband and my kids and we asked some people, where did they keep those men that were working? So they showed us this building. And we went in there Anyway, so my father went to work every day. What was he going to do with me? There was a, a piece of furniture in there. Yeah, it's also in here. And he, I was in there all day until he came home. We found it. In 98, we went back there to that house. When they told us to go to that house, we went there and my daughter-in-law looked through the keyhole and she said, there's a piece of furniture in there. So we asked them to open it. And when I saw it, don't, don't ask, a little hysterical. <laughs> I spent seven weeks in there. So, and then, you know, my father was petrified. He couldn't, how long is he going to keep me? He didn't know what's going to happen, and he, he went to work and I said nothing all day and every noise scared the daylight out of me. This is something I really don't talk about, but one day they threw a body in that room. I didn't know. My father came home, <laughs> and of course, you know, they took it away, and then my father told me, you know, when it was okay, that I can come out. And then he told me what had happened, because I never saw it. I just heard a, a bang, you know, I didn't know what happened. So this Joseph, believe it or not, did it again. They he came to get me. We went on the train. Uh, I don't remember how long. It was it was not a regular train. I don't remember. I don't know why, but he put my suitcase on the floor in the hallway, and he told me to lie down and pretend I'm sleeping so that nobody would talk to me and ask me any questions. And he took me to his nephew, who was a Catholic priest, in a very small village. Um, very close to the Russian border. And I was there for two years. The housekeeper didn't know who I was. She thought I was his niece. I slept with her. I was scared. What if I talk in the middle of the night? She never found out, thank God, because not, not, not myself or the priest would have been safe. And then 1944, then he gave me this phony birth certificate and with, that, with a phony name. He got it from some priest that gave it to him and my name, instead of Anita Helfgott, I became Anna Yavorska. 
typical Polish name. With that phony identity, I could go, you know, I could be at the priest. He knew, he knew who I was because he told me, you know, Joseph told him, but not the housekeeper, she didn't know. He was very, very nice to me. She was a misery. <laughs> Believe it or not, at the end of the war, and I don't know why, but Joseph wrote me that she went to jail. Why? I don't know. But I wasn't surprised. Apparently she caused a lot of trouble for the priest and the other members of the family. I don't know what, I don't, I don't want to know. But she was not very nice. She had to take care of me because I was supposed to be the priest's niece, but she wasn't happy about it. And then uh, 1944, and I went to, I think it was March, February, March, the Russians came back. You know, they fought back, and they came back, and since we were so close to the Russian border, they came to us very early in 44. Didn't mean I was free. The priest told me to be careful. Don't say anything. Doesn't mean that the war's not over. My grandparents were. Um, as a matter of fact, it was a fu very funny. My grandfather and my mother's my, my mother's father didn't think my father was religious enough for my mother. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know that from my aunt. You know, how would I know? But um, no, we were. You know, we went to the synagogue on the holidays, and yeah, then my mother kept the kosher home. And Friday night, I remember, you know, we, she lit candles and we had a, a Friday night dinner like we do today. But it was not, they were definitely not Orthodox. They're not, they weren't. Not my, not my, my father wasn't, my, my mother's parents were. But once they got married, my mother, I guess she adjusted. So then I was at this prison, I'm learning how to be a Catholic. I still don't know what it meant to be Jewish because I was so young. You know, I know what I saw at home, but all of a sudden I have to forget, like forget who you are. Although the books, you know, when I said goodbye to my father for the second time, he said, always remember who you are, and that's the title of my book because he said, you will have to do whatever you have to do, whatever they tell you you have to do. But please always remember who you are. Well, he knew they were going to, trying to make me a Catholic so that I could survive. But he wanted me to remember who I was. When she wasn't around, you know, because she thought I should know something by the age of 10, 11, he taught, he gave me lessons. First of all, he gave me, I learned how to read from that teacher who, who used me as a guinea pig. I learned how to read. And all he had were books about fake saints and Bible. So I started to read the Bible. And you know, the, the, the beginning of the Bible is the same as we have. You know? So anyway, but which I didn't know because I never read the Bible when I was with my parents. So that's, and if I needed questions, I've asked, I asked them questions if I didn't understand something. And then I started going to church, of course. And uh, I was too young to, to have uh, communion or, you know, so it was okay, no problem. But I went to church and I learned all the prayers and, uh, you know, it's good, I'm glad I know doesn't hurt. As I said, he always told me, always remember who you are. So I knew who I was, even though I had to do whatever I had to do. After a while, I really started believing and I would pray and pray and pray that my father, I knew my mother was gone, but that my father would survive. Didn't happen. <laughs> a little bit disillusioned from the whole religious point of view. All the praying didn't help. Anyway, 
Um, after two years over there, I told you the Russians came. And one day, a Russian, a woman, a Russian soldier shows up. She was sent, sent by the original Polish family, by Joseph's family, to get me. I don't know, maybe the priest wrote, take her, what am I going to do with this kid? <laughs> you know, priests are not married, like, what's he going to do with me? So he figured now it's safe. So a Russian woman soldier came to get me. Um, I wasn't sure where I'm going, is this good or is this bad? I mean, you know, as a kid. But she, she told me not to worry. She told me she's Jewish. I don't have to be afraid anymore to be Jewish or, you know, it's over. Anyway, she took me and we traveled. Oh God, I can't remember how long, but there was chaos on the roads. You know, everybody was going somewhere. Everybody was moving. And finally got to the original Polish family and then I felt okay because they knew who I was. I didn't have to hide it anymore. I didn't have to be scared anymore. You know, when the war ended, we started hearing everything that happened. You know, you didn't know when the, during the war. You knew what was happening in your area. The radios were censored. There was no TV in those days. So people didn't know about Auschwitz and Majdanek and Treblinka and all those camps and, and what went on. They didn't know. They only knew in their immediate area that the Jewish people were rounded up and taken away. Where to? No, I mean, maybe some people knew, but my dad's family I was with didn't know anything. But then the war ended and those horrible things started coming out. You know, the newspapers and the radio and Six million, you know, it was just, we had no idea. Many, many years later, because Joseph would not tell me. I knew he was dead, but I didn't know how or what happened. Many years later, I was already married, and I kept asking, I want to know, I want to know, because we kept corresponding, I want to know what happened to my father. So eventually, he wrote me that one day, there were only three Jewish people, men left. And he heard, Joseph heard, that in a neighboring town, whoever was left, they were killing. So he tried to to let to warn my father, but he said he couldn't because where he was working, there were all kinds of soldiers and God knows what else. And in any case, he couldn't warn my father. So they eventually got the other two, and my father, <laughs> I guess in desperate attempt, jumped in the river on that, where that bridge was, and he started swimming from one end to the other, but they wouldn't let him out. You know, on that side were the Ukrainian police. On, anyway, he got tired, came out, they killed him. They killed those three men that same day. And they buried them beside that bridge, and near, near, it, there were like a train tracks too. We were there, we went there, my husband and I, and my son, my daughter-in-law, my two granddaughters. No idea where, the, where they buried them. There's no market, there was nothing. I mean, we were there, we were on that field, and I needed to be there, but I don't know where he was buried. So now I knew what happened to him. And I was hoping, he knew the woods like the back of his head. And Joseph told me that he kept telling him to run, to go, go, go. But you know, if there was no help out there, how would you survive? I guess he didn't go. Religion kept me going. I became so 
I don't know religious, but I believe that if I pray enough, everything is going to be okay. I'll be back with my father. So I think that's what kept me going. I didn't go to school. I had no friends. I mean, it was, you know, later on when I was at the priest, I have to laugh before I tell you this. I had to look after a cow. I remember that. I had different um, chores to do. I don't have a picture of the cow. I'm sorry, but I don't have a picture in the book. I had to work on, on the field with other kids. So, you know, we talk, kids talk to each other. But that's a, but that. That cow got me into more trouble than I can tell you. It used to run away from me into somebody's cabbage patch or some kind of a, some garden and I couldn't catch her. She ran, <laughs> she ran too fast. Eventually they put a log around her neck so it would slow her down a bit. I tell you, I never hated anything in my life like I hated that cow. <laughs> Because whenever she got into somewhere where she shouldn't be, I got punished. I, living with a priest, supposedly his niece, the only person I was afraid of was of the housekeeper. Because, God forbid, she should say something in my sleep. I mean, who knows, right? If you have a dream, you could speak out. So she was the only one I was afraid of. But no, no close call then, thank you. You know, so many things happen that's so difficult to understand because Ukraine became a country. The Polish people were kicked out. So I traveled with the Polish family from, their, from the, where they had lived, I don't know how many years, to Poland, you know, the borders changed, you know that. So we went, so we ended up in a town called Kluczburg, which used to be German. And we got a little house that used to belong to some German family. And you know, we never saw them, but we got this little house. And we, you know, we got in. In the meantime, Joseph was not there. The, when the Russians came in, he had worked for the Germans, right? So they took him to Siberia. So he wasn't there, just the two women, the, the wife and the daughter were there. And I told you, terrible things were happening because the, um, not, not once we were in Poland, but until we left. The Ukrainians went on a rampage. They were killing Polish people. They wanted to scare them so they'd go, which they went. One day I remember they knocked on the door and they told us we had 24 hours or whatever and the two women and myself left. And they had a cow and we went on these, um, on these trains that used to take the, the people to the camps. And we went in there with our furniture and, and cows and God only knows what, and we were traveling west. Also took a long time because then we would go for a while and then they took away the engine and we sat. And then eventually they attached an engine. So what happened was that the, all the kids would go get out when we stopped and run around and get grass for the cows, for the animals. And we went into, you know, if we saw fruit somewhere, I mean, we, we took it, you know, we stole it. Anyway, eventually we got to this place, we got this little house, we got settled. And we were very close to railway tracks. And you know, there was nothing, because whatever Germans didn't take, or the Nazis didn't take, the Russians did. So there was nothing to buy, there was nothing to get. We needed, we needed heat. So when the train would come by and they had coal, and, and they would stop, 
So a bunch of us would run like crazy, but kids, we'd run on top of the coal, we'd throw off as much as we could. And when the train left, we would go with pails and pick it up and take it home. And that's how we heated, um, you know, the, the place. <laughs> and I think of that, my God, what I didn't do, right? <laughs> I mean, it was stealing is what it was, but who thought about that? There was nothing. So if you could get some coal, that was a big deal. And I knew how to read, and I knew how to write, but I didn't, I didn't know any math. I can't remember what grade they put me in. I absolutely don't know. And one day I come from school. It happens to be April Fool's, 1946. And there's a car in front of the house. And this daughter, Lucia, comes out and she tells me, your aunt is inside. I'm thinking, what kind of stupid joke is that? You know, I didn't believe her. But I went inside and it was my aunt. And I knew her. I recognized her immediately because she was... We used to go to Krakow and visit her all the time, my mother and I. She had lost two children and a husband. She was saved by Oscar Schindler. I can't tell you what the reunion was like. I was very happy to see her, but she was so emotional. She lost two kids and she found me. You know, that was how it happened was that my father, he left a letter to his brother who was living in Belgium, Congo, who was an engineer. And he also left a few addresses. One of them was my mother's sister who lived in Brooklyn, New York. So this Polish man had promised my father that if I survive, he'll get in touch with my family. He didn't have to do that. This was such a special man. I cannot tell you how wonderful human being he was. He sent a postcard to New York, which I think walked there. <laughs> you know, he went by, by boat, God only knows how long it took. And he said in the postcard that I was alive, that my parents were not, and that he had me. He figured, who's going to come from New York to get, you, uh, to get me? I mean, like, you know. The thing is that this end of mine survived, and she was only about 100 kilometers from me, the one that was saved by Schindler. So they sent her a telegram from New York that I was alive. She came to get me. And she was staying with a cousin of mine who, who got her a, a car and a driver. And that's, you know, and she wouldn't leave me for, she, I had to go. She's taking me right now, you can't stay. I mean, what do I do? I mean, I want to go with her, but listen, these people saved my life, right? So I wouldn't go unless Joseph came too. <laughs> and he did. And we went um, to where my aunt was staying with my cousin. We, he stayed with us a few days. And when he saw that I was okay, he left. Their granddaughter, their great-granddaughter, um, is very close with me, so uh, every time I go to Poland, the March of the Living, she meets me. She just graduated as a medical doctor. And she went to Yad Vashem to see, you know, the, the, they have the plaque. And she took her parents there to see, and they're very proud that they're mentioned there, of course. I, I, you know, I wrote to Yad Vashem, I explained to them what had happened and that I wanted them honored, and they were. My, my aunt already had papers to, live, to leave Poland. Nobody wanted to stay there after what had happened. And, and the Russians were back. And so, you, you know, it was never really good. I told you there was shortages of everything. I had to steal coal. And... Um, so we, she, I left with her that day because Joseph said he'll come. Don't worry, I will come. And um, my aunt took me, listen, I had, I had licensed my hair. I had licensed my clothes. Nobody really looked after me 
uh, well because it's not that they were bad, but things were so difficult. Every once in a while, they would put a rag with the gas, with gasoline on my head. It didn't do anything. It was supposedly it would kill the lice, but it didn't do anything. So when my aunt got me, she sat for hours with a fine tooth comb, and she cleaned me up. And they burned my clothes that I came in, and she took me shopping and bought me new clothes and new shoes because um, I went with these shoes from my father, you know, like high, high, lost, laced up, laced up boot. In the summer I was barefoot. In the winter I wore those shoes, but my feet grew, so the toes came out of the shoes. So they put the strings around them. I tell you, I have so many shoes now, I don't know what to do with them because of that. It's just crazy. It's because I never had any at that time. I, actually, my husband, my, my late husband, built me a cupboard with shelves, with doors, and shoes were lined up. And I told him this was my security. <laughs> not, not anything else but shoes. Anyway, so that's what happened. And eventually, she already had papers to leave Poland. I had no papers. First of all, you know, my aunt was, I had to change overnight, you know, she had no patience. But two cousins of mine survived. The one she was living with and another one who was a wonderful, wonderful, I loved him when I first saw him. Had a lot of patience, spent a lot of time talking to me. The war is over. You don't have to be afraid. We are your family. You can be Jewish. You know, talked and talked and talked to me. He's the one that brought me back. You know, that I could feel comfortable, that I didn't have to be afraid anymore. I mean, I used to run away from my aunt in the, in the first church I got when I was in the church. And she used to come and drag me out. She didn't want to lose me as a Catholic. She finally found me. I tell you, she had no psychology. She didn't know that eventually, give me time. So this cousin, you know, was very helpful, and he told her to leave me alone. If I want to go to her church and I find solace there, let her go. Took a while. I lived in I lived in Paris with my aunt. For, uh, um, she remarried eventually, and he had a daughter. So we consider each other sisters, although there is no blood relationship at all. I went to school in Paris. I learned how to speak French. Uh, you know, today I, I can speak it, but it's not as good as it used to be, but I can read and I understand everything. We were hoping to go to New York. I mean, you had family in New York. And not, you know, the aunt of mine had emigrated I don't know, in the 20s. So my aunt had a sister and a brother in, in New York. But you know, there was such a thing as a Polish quarter. You couldn't, only so many people were let in every year. So we were on a quarter list, God only knows where. In 1948, Canada finally opened its doors. I don't know how much you know about Canadian history, but there was a time when none was too many. In 1948, they opened the, they opened the door, and I came here. I was 14. I came to Canada, not a word of English, so here we go again. <laughs> they put me in grade 8. They finally put me in a grade where I was more, more or less supposed to be. We stopped in Montreal for a day. I spoke perfect French. I could not understand a word of the Quebecois. I couldn't. It was so difficult to understand. Today I can, but you know, at that time I couldn't. We came to Toronto. My aunt from New York 
her, my, her daughter and her husband and their son were waiting at Union Station. And we finally had family. We left, my aunt had to leave her husband and his daughter in, in Paris because they have no papers when we did. Nine months later, we, she brought them here. And her name is, my sister's name is Tamara. She spoke perfect French still. I already had an English accent, so she used to laugh at me that my French was not so good anymore. She ended up being a, a French, a university teacher of French. She lives in Minneapolis, and um, we are very, very close. We are like sisters. Was that I couldn't speak English, and my aunt had to work, so she, you know, through my family in New York. They gave us an address of somebody in Toronto who originally came from the same town as my, as my mother. He, came, he had been living in Canada for many years. Anyway, he sponsored us, and that's how we came to Toronto. So we had them. My, you know, my family who was here to meet us went back to New York. I went to school. I told you they put me in grade eight. I had to learn English, had a wonderful teacher, spent a lot of time with me. I went to night school. I had to learn English in a hurry because, you know, here I was in grade eight, I wanted to go to, I wanted to, go to high school. So, I had, so by the end of the year, yeah, I spoke English. Which, which? I, I have a report card, guys, that I'm not going to show anybody. The first three months were terrible. The second three months, we got the report card every three months. And the third one was really good. I couldn't believe it. I mean, not wonderful, but much better than the other two. I went to um, Humid Public School on Vaughan Road, north of St. Clair. And then we moved because my uncle and my and his daughter came. We couldn't believe we lived in one room on somebody's flat, so we had to move. So we moved from there to Queen Street, we, and we got an apartment behind a, a store. So the kitchen was in the back, and upstairs there were two rooms or three rooms. I don't even remember. I couldn't go to Van Root Collegiate where I wrote all my entrance exams because we moved. So I went to Central High School of Commerce. You know, I couldn't go to university. It was out of the question. I had to work, so I learned how to type. I went short hat. I own bookkeeping. And I quit school at the end of grade 10 because I had to go to work was not happy about it, but there was no question that I had to do that. And I, I worked after school in the laundry. I mean, I worked all the, uh, you know, I had to help them. They were struggling, my aunt and uncle. Guess what? I went to school as a mature student, and I graduated in 1985 with a BA in psychology. Never too late. I always wanted to do that, and I couldn't do it when I was young. So the kids used to say, what are you doing here? Why are you in school? You don't have to be in school. We have to be in school. I said, I want to be in school, because I didn't have the opportunity. I would sit late in the evening and write essays. And my two sons were at York University at the same time. So it was the funniest thing I have to tell. You. I have two sons. The oldest son was embarrassed because his mother was in school with him. So he would <laughs> sit with the newspaper <laughs> hide from me. And I knew that, so I never went near him. And the other one would yell, hi, mom, down the hall. <laughs> anyway, it was fun being in school with them. So I, I graduated the same year as my youngest son. 
the survivors, there weren't many of us. I'm the, one of the younger ones, and I'm 83. But the older ones are dying out. They're going. So eventually there'll be no one. And you know what? There are people who deny that the Holocaust ever happened. They do. There was a lot of deniers. There was one in Toronto, his name was Ernest. I went to um, one day to hear him speak. He was a Holocaust denier. And when I heard him saying that Holocaust didn't happen, that's all a lie, etc., that propelled me to start speaking. Because I, how can he say that? I mean, I lived through that. You know, I lost my parents and everybody. So that's when I started, 1981. It's a long time ago. But if I had, you know, I don't know how much longer. I go on the March of the Living every year, you know, with others. That's a week in Poland and a week in Israel. And it's physically and mentally very stressful. And I, this was my 18th trip and my kids say, Mom, that's it. You're not going anymore. So what do you think I told him? Don't tell me what to do, right? <laughs> <clears throat> I'll see next year how I feel, if I'm healthy. Otherwise, that could be it. But I, you know, I go with a, a bunch of teenagers, 16-year-olds. They're wonderful, and I love them, and that's why I go. And I think... Whatever I can contribute while I'm here, that's why I do it. It's not easy, let me tell you. Even right now, it's just takes a lot out of you. Because my husband never, he knew, he knew the whole story, but he didn't want me to talk because he was afraid it's too much for me. In the meantime, it was percolating in here, you know? It had. It had to come out. I had was I, I was I had to talk about it outside of my home. So you know, eventually, you know, he he understood, and it was very very helpful. Mm -hmm.